Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only Mission Impossible podcast whose composer is currently under investigation by the Mueller team. Uh, <laughs> this is Drew Taylor once again, joined by Charles Hood. Hello. And we have a really special episode today, don't we? Yes, we do. You want to tell everybody what it well, is? Well, I mean, we've been we've been hyping this up, but Robert Ellswit, the Oscar-winning cinematographer, who I love so very, very much, and I, I know you do as well. Yes, I do. Uh, Especially after talking to him. Yeah, he's just so humble and so funny. Had some really great stories, so we're very excited to share this with you. But before we do, we should talk about the release dates for Mission Impossible 7 and 8, because they have been announced. Yes, so the first one is July 23rd, 2021. And the second one is August 5th, 2022. So set your calendars. Yeah, get I'm ready. ready. We got a little, I think a little less than 900 days. What? Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, until we get that first one. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be here before you know it. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm ready. Uh, before we start this interview, we should uh, just let you know that it is that obviously you'll notice this episode's a little longer than usual. Yep, it's a little bit of some some bonus content for mm-hmm. you. Um, Elswit shot a James Bond movie and a Jason Bourne movie, so we were having him talk a little about that, and so it was uh, amazing to hear him talk about it to- was. Tomorrow Never it was Dies great. and Bourne Legacy and how those movies are made, and 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 just it's 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 really cool. So we think we think you'll like that. And we also want to tease that this morning we spoke to another person involved in the franchise that you'll be very excited about, but we will not reveal who that was. No. We're going to tease you. But it was, (laughs) yeah, it was an amazing experience, I think. I think we're going to hear more from him, too, and, oh, I see, I just gave it away that it's a man. Oh, okay. Whoa, I'm just talking too much already. (laughs) But, yeah. But he is... He was really funny, and it was great, and it's going to be a very, it's going to be another long episode, because yeah. we talked to him for two hours. Yeah, <laughs> but worth it, and very, very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, so. Anyway, whatever, but let's talk about Elswit now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's just a, a, sorry to tease you too much, but. Yeah, uh, here's Elswit, and we'll be back at the end of the show. Well, uh, we are so thrilled to be joined today by living legend, I would say. Oh, my God. Living legend, Whoa. Robert Ellswit. That's so, so sad. <laughs> Oscar winner for There Will Be Blood. Oh, yeah. Oscar yeah. winner? Right. Mm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I can feel the ego coming off of you. It's just a, it's a too much. I may have to get up and walk around. <laughs> this is um, way too much for me. Uh, Robert Oss, uh, obviously shot Ghost Protocol and Rogue Nation, and... Uh, how did you initially get involved with with? Uh, well, it's Brad, Protocol? Brad Bird, and the original um, uh, uh, Ghost Protocol. Um, I just you know met with him and we got along and, and uh, talked about all the movies we loved and and uh, hit it off and so he asked me to do it. And did you did you look at the previous movies? Oh yeah, we looked at the them series? all. Did you watch them all. with Brad and how? What was the um, like? Yeah, with Brad. I think we looked at all. You know, starting with the De Palma, the original one, and then saw how. At least to me, anyway, it seemed like it went a little downhill, ending with the last. Uh, I think it was John Woo's version, the Australian Mission Impossible, yeah. which was, it was kind of, you know, I don't think anybody was terribly happy with it, but why and how and all that, and and then JJ's revival, JJ bringing it all back to life again, and how he did it and what he did and what was important, and and uh, finding the heart of it again, which is of course the heart of it all is, is Mr. Cruz. Mm-hmm. And um, and Brad was really excited about getting all of that stuff together and finding some fabulous stuff for him to do. And, and uh, you know, he loves th- – and, and Brad was a huge fan of all those – all the action movies, um, the sort of big-budget action movies that you can imagine, you know, going back to the Bond movies even. So we referenced a lot of, a lot of stuff. Did you look at Die Hard? Because I know he's a oh, big yes. fan of Die Hard. <laughs> yes, we did. I just looked at it again because I did a film – with uh, another great guy, Ross and Thurber, um, in Vancouver with The Rock. And, right. skyscraper. And, and, and Skyscraper is it's kind of Die Hard meets Towering Inferno a little bit. I guess it's a little glib, but, but so we watched Die Hard several times. And you kind of learn to appreciate not just how well made and well directed it is, just how well written it is yeah. and how well acted it is. Of course, who can beat Alan Rickman, the world's greatest villain, but also every single person in that movie, every character in that movie, his entire gang, yeah. are wonderfully etched out. Everybody dies in a wonderfully interesting way, and you get to know them all. Yeah. And you got to work with one of those guys in yes. Ghost Protocol. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, uh, so, 
Did you talk at all about how, like, what you wanted it to look like, like, uh, like in relation to the previous movies at all? Or you, you know, know, I, I, um, it grew out of lots of conversations. It had to do with finding the right locations and finding places that you know how these films are constructed. And I don't know how much Chris has talked to you about any of this, but the original version of of, of uh, Ghost Protocol, and this may be something because most of the people involved probably wouldn't speak about this, but I can because nobody gives a shit about what I say. <laughs> so the original version of this movie was that at the end of it, Tom Cruise um, stops being Ethan Hawke, the agent, and becomes Ethan Hawke, the secretary. The whole version of this was they're going to put another ILM mission unit together with different another actor, maybe it's Jeremy Renner, maybe some who knows who it is, and they're going to go through this series of wild events, and at the end... Tom gets to be the secretary and a new agent takes over the franchise, which I think seemed kind of nutty, but that was kind of the uh, marching orders. And this is a period when Tom was maybe a little more out of favor. I don't know if that's the right word, but but I, I, it kind of everybody kind of had signed off on that. And the script was a little loose, but that's what the script was. The original script that I had was uh, kind of like that. And so you meet these other agents and then they free Tom from prison, and then they go through all this other stuff that happens, and the secretary gets killed, one of my favorite actors I've worked with a couple of times, and uh, Tom Wilkerson. And uh, and then you know, Tom kind of, was, uh, there was a big battle at the end in the snow, and all this stuff happens, and then Tom gets elevated to secretary and all that. And I can't remember who the new agent people would be, but uh, it doesn't matter now. So as the film was made, and it's a very inside, the guy who has the best version of this, by the way, is Chris. And someday when he writes his memoirs, <laughs> when, when he, you know, 40, 50 years from now, you'll be able to read about the inside true story of how Tom Cruise took a movie in which his character ends up being booted out of the franchise. How he took that movie and turned it into re-upping the franchise, taking over the movie, taking over the franchise, and starting it all over again. Right. Really. Yeah. Uh, it's way too complicated. And, and, <laughs> and I, I would be, it would be all hearsay on my part, so right. I don't want to get into it. But that was the look of the film, which was where we started. Kind of grew out of finding these various, the, the, you know what happens in these films is there are set piece action scenes that are kind of built into, um, there's almost in a way a starting point for the script. And I'm not sure if Tom comes in and says, you know, I want to, um, I was thinking of the last movie because I can remember everything, but, you know, I want to um, I want to hold my breath underwater like one of those guys who holds their breath underwater forever. I want a scene where I, like, do something magic underwater and container and I almost die. I want to be strapped to the side of a plane uh, and f- take off and fly around and then break into the plane. I want to ride a motorcycle at 150 miles an hour, Grand Prix style, without a helmet. And what was the other one? <laughs> anyway, I want to do those things. And Chris, uh, you figure out a story uh, and call me when you're done. Right. It's not quite like that. Right. But it has that feel. And uh, I'm trying to remember the other big stunt that started the movie. Um, the, on, well, the, on the side of the plane? No, I got the, the side of the plane. Yeah. And then there's What's also right after Dubai's that? and Ghost Protocol. No, well, that's yeah. the Ghost Protocol. But, the but I mean, uh, the last film had a, a real sense of that because to find a story... Uh, to create a story and knit all those pieces together is kind of the magic of, of of making a movie like that and without a story to begin with. And what you end up having to begin with is probably an idea in Tom's head and Chris's head about, well, we want to do these great stunts. When I, when I did, um, it's another kind of, when we did Ghost Protocol, we did the initial, we started with the stuff in Europe and the stuff in Dubai. And we knew that Tom was going to get broken out of prison. We knew he was going to climb the world's tallest building and do wonderful stuff and break in and steal something. And then he was going to get in a couple of traffic accidents. And God, how did it end up? I don't remember. It ended up in the car park. In the car park. Oh, yeah, Yeah. the the exciting car park. Yeah. Jim Bissell's great car park. The great production designer, Jim Bissell. So the... um, the story around it changed dramatically because we, we broke Tom out of prison. We shot a lot of um, the interstitial material where you find out who the bad guys are and what they're doing and stuff like that and why they're doing it, sort of. 
Although I don't think anybody remembers the bad guy from Ghost Protocol. Do they? Well, well we do. You Hendrix. do? Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. We, we're, we worship this franchise. You so do. We know okay. all about it. So you know what? Right. Swedish Special Forces. Yeah. yeah, yeah the Swedish Special yeah. Forces. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's hard to remember. A lot of his scenes aren't in the movie. So yeah. Yeah. We've, we've seen the alternate opening where he's sort of giving his dissertation. And, yes, yes. Yeah. So a lot of stuff didn't make it. So um, <laughs> at some point when we came back to Canada, came back to Vancouver and did a lot of the interior work, we'd already done the this sort of big two, one big stunt in the building and... Uh, Breaking out of prison in Czechoslovakia <laughs> and in Russia, um, Chris McQuarrie came in, and Chris McQuarrie um, and Tom uh, sat down and said, "How do we fix this so that?" And there's a much better version of what I'm describing that Chris can give you, which he'll never he'll never give anybody until you know he's in his 80s probably. Right. <laughs> but there's uh, Chris McQuarrie came in and he kind of rewrote it the the last well half maybe more, and and made it so that we had to change a few things that we shot at the beginning, like add lines, reshoot little pieces so that it all made sense. And he tied the whole thing together and made it so that at the end of the movie, uh, the only people who get, uh, Tom ends up not becoming the secretary, but just goes on in his own lonely way. And, you know, we meet the woman he was married to, and, you know, he realizes he's got to go on by himself because, you know, uh, even though... Um, Hoffman isn't going to come back and try and kill anybody because, you know, he's not around anymore. Uh, he doesn't want to put the rest of his, his life is, you know, he's going to solitary figure. He's going to be, you know, this guy who walks off into a, a fog bank and appears in the next episode. Right. So, and that was Chris's work. And what was great about having, and Chris was there, and he could explain to me, because I would get confused a lot, um, what was going on. Like, does this tie to this? Because I would have lots of questions. I would, we'd be doing something, and I would go, "Wait, now, if Jeremy Renner, does he actually know that?" You know, and I'd have some yeah. goofy <laughs> question. And that whole thing on the train was really. I don't know if you know the movie really well, but um, you know what happens. Essentially, what happens in the train, it's it's a literal and metaphorical. Tom Cruise take over the movie. <laughs> he takes back. He takes over the the IMF crew. And he takes over the movie. Right, right. That was actually, that scene does both. And he walks through you and he says, okay, here's what's happened up till now. And here's what you're all going to do. And here's who all the bad guys are. And he sort of lays the whole thing out. And the rest of the IMF team sits there and goes, okay. And that was that moment. And Chris, you know, Chris and Tom created this, you know, here I am, I'm back. Yeah. You got me out of prison, and we're not going to do that other script that you all read when you signed on. We're doing this new script, and here it is. And so that was, in a way, kind of the most inside baseball version of it that I could possibly tell without screwing it up, but that's what wow. happened. Well, we wanted to know what it was like working with Bird, because this is the first time you'd worked with a filmmaker who came from animation. Yeah. And I, uh, a lot of the jokes and things in the movie are very kind of cartoony or, or have a little bit more kind of visual punch. My favorite is when uh, when uh, Peg is explaining that Cruz has to go outside of the building yes. and, you, and you do that whip pan over <laughs> yeah. and he says, yes. what? And that, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. No, he's, he was wonderful at that. And there was, there's one moment I love. Um, and maybe, you know, he, that's his sensibility. I mean, um, when Cruz breaks out of prison and you see the guard, um, I'm trying to remember the exact way it played out but you see there's a guard and he's mean and nasty and and all the prison doors open and this one sort of weird little character with a very expressive face he casts people who look like cartoon characters in this prison <laughs> and uh you know and the, the the they sort of look at each other and i think they they you know he knocks the guy out or something like that but that whole thing was designed like an animated sequence all mm -hmm. the way through and i think the the actual prison break where tom you know the guy comes in the room and he goes underneath you know he has yeah. this fight it's, it's sort of a comic fight but at the same time uh it was laid out really well and i think what brad also came to realize and he might have understood it he had we had you know storyboards for these sequences and sometimes sometimes animatics even but that that once you start a fight or once you start action beats that play out um the way Tom plays them out, because there's no stunt person, right? Right. He's actually running all these stunts himself. So they, there's a certain speed to them, there's a certain reality to them that it's hard to uh, dice up into small pieces because he doesn't want to do 
a third of the stunt, a third of the stunt, a third of the stunt. So in Brad's original conception, there were more little cut pieces. There were more little beats where you see somebody do something, and then you cut to somebody else, and they do something, and then you cut to a wider shot, and you see it happen. And it just doesn't always work mm -hmm. because of the way live action differs from animation. And the other thing I think that was um, maybe a, more of a surprise for Brad was that the commitment to, you know, when we walk away from this set, we're never coming back. There isn't going to be a screening two months from now, and if the scene doesn't work, the animator's going to come in and actually change something. Right. There's no fixing it. <laughs> and I think that was genuinely kind of like, it wasn't, it wasn't like he didn't know, but the reality of it was a little brutal. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if we do this and we, you, you, you know, there's no, we're not going to, I never liked, you know, he, there were things he didn't like about certain scenes, certain scripts, certain things. And, and he came to, you know, it was a, it was a difficult process for him to realize that it wasn't difficult, but it was um, not as much fun for him because he knew, you know, the way, uh, the way animation is done, which is wonderful. It's, it's very organic. It's much more organic because you you, you create these characters and they interact with each other and you do pencil drawings and you create a kind of small animated version of it and you show it to people and you show it to people who don't know it and you show it to people who work with and it evolves in a much more organic way over a long period of time. And that's not how movies are made, honestly. Right. I mean, they aren't. I mean, you, the hardest thing, I uh, worked with a, a wonderful director, Tony Gilroy, who said the hardest decision he ever has to make is when to say, that's it, we're done and walk away from a shot mm -hmm. or a set, you know? And that's really it, because he knows that's really it. There is no return, um, for the most part. Uh, you know, additional photography down the line is not something that happens on most movies. Right. Um, it does seem to be built into the Mission Impossible movies, too. A, a little bit. I mean, but you can't restage a giant action scene. Well, I mean, you can, but, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't happen that often. Right. Um, and the complicated nature, I mean, he was... The other thing that happened, too, was um, the way the Dubai sequence was conceived originally uh, in animatic form, storyboards to, to animatics, was a very, um, it, 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 made, it had shots in it that could only be done in a computer, the kinds of things that happen in animation, or visual effects, too, where the camera is someplace it actually can't be. Physically can't be. Like if you were in a helicopter or on a scaffold or hanging on a wire or something, your camera can be in those places. But there's certain things that happen in animation where you don't have to play by those rules. And there's lots of times, you know, Spider-Man doesn't play by those rules. Right. There's lots of action movies that don't play by those rules. But with Tom, what happened was we, we looked at the animatic that Brad had created with, with um, all the pieces put together and all the different image sizes of the building sequence in Dubai. And at the end of it, Tom just said, um, okay, who's me? Where am I? What am I? How do I do this? And going through it, it was say, uh, okay, that's you in this shot. And this shot, it came, this is obviously digital Tom. This is digital Tom here. And then, okay, this is you. And then there's digital Tom in this next shot. And then there's, and then after a while, Tom went, there is no such thing as digital Tom. He doesn't exist. There's no digital Tom. Right. I'm climbing the building. I'm climbing the whole building, and I'm in every shot. And there's no fake. There's no phony moment. And he got up and left. And that was the end of that. Wow. So there, the animatic had to be redone, and it had to be reflect what could really be done. And it involved kind of an extensive little, you know, survey of, of uh, the Burj Khalif in, in Dubai, and uh, as only you can do in a country where there, there are no rules and there are no politics and the only people in charge are these kind of middle-aged men with beards, you could actually go into their building and ask them to kick out all the windows and uh, create a space that you could shoot a sequence like that. In. Right. Nowhere else would anybody let you do that. Right. So that, that's... but. But he was, you know, that's, he, he's right. He's in, there's no fakery. And that's, that's the, the, the thing that's that he insists on. Yeah. You know, he's got a, a little wire that gets, you know, taken away digitally later. It gets removed. But he's hanging on a very thin wire, uh, wearing a harness under his costume. And he's standing outside there uh, doing stuff that I can't imagine anybody else would do. Was well, there any kind of net or anything? No. 
<laughs> so nut. <laughs> so crazy. He's so nut. Yeah, and should, we, he, should we get into the Bruges sequence? I mean, that, yeah. I mean, can you talk about the IMAX? Yeah, the, I mean, was, I thought it was, a, it was a pretty cool idea. I mean, Brad always wanted to do little IMAX pieces throughout the whole movie. We did the beginning. We did that, you know, the jump at the beginning with the other the original mission crew. There was an IMAX. But the cool thing about um, if you see the movie in IMAX, because we shot film, we shot the IMAX film version, and you project it and an IMAX projector. And we were very lucky we had, there's an IMAX theater, believe it or not, in Dubai, or there was, at the racetrack of all places. And the IMAX corporation came in and they tooled it, they put it back together so it worked perfectly. And we looked at our dailies there. We actually got filmed back and looked at it. So we were able to see it on a big screen. And the idea was uh, kind of stolen from the old, this was Cinerama. I don't know if you, you, you guys are too young to remember any of this, but there would be the introduction of Cinerama was something like John Cameron Swayze showing you like a vista with a boat or something like that. And he would go, this is the way people normally see movies. And you'd see like 133 or 185 or whatever it was. And the curtain would be closed. And he'd go, but this is Cinerama. And the curtain would open. And all of a sudden the image would triple, quadruple in size from one end of the wall to the other. You'd see this gigantic image would open up. So that was the idea behind Tom going out the window in Burj Dubai. Yeah, we so you're, that you're in 240, and if you see it in the IMAX theater, it's quite astonishing because yeah. it's all the whole movie's letterbox in, 65, in 70 millimeter in, in an IMAX projection. It's letterbox because it, it doesn't fill, fit the whole 15 per f- uh, you know, projection print. But when you go out the window, you see it open up and become, and it just surrounds your point of view, you know, your angle of oh, vision. Yeah. And we saw it at the Lincoln Center yeah. IMAX, and I, and we were hooting and hollering. Yeah. I mean, it was the most amazing thing. And, it, you know, you're looking down, and there's a little bit of visual effects work down below because in Dubai, there are no, you know, there's kind of nothing down there to give you a sense of distance. And there's nothing to tell you how, how high you are. Yeah. Because you were just looking at structures. So they put little cars and people down there. So you'd understand how, you know, you, you never end up that high. There's nowhere you can go like that except in an airplane. You know, yeah. that building is really very, very high. So um, anyway, so that's that was how, that, that was the reason for that. And that the IMAX would add kind of a thrill to these pieces that I think it really did. No yeah. question. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, also, Macquarie told us one key sequence in that in that scene is going through the floor. Oh and yeah. Bird, Bird was insistent on going through the floor. So was that a real rig that you? Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So it was a set on top of a set. Wait, which one do you mean? Which shot? When it, when it goes from the to the hotel room above to the hotel room. Oh, that was in, in in um, that was me on uh, on on way too small a soundstage in Vancouver. <laughs> Going like that, going like that, yeah. Um, that was a, the challenge of that for me, I guess, was aside from figuring, you know, one of the, one of the things that it's really oh god, it was, I, it's all coming back to me now. I, um, you know, Should figuring out, figuring out because the marvelous, marvelous um, stunt coordinator in that movie is the great uh, um, Greg Schmears, and he has to figure out how to hang Tom in all these different positions and how he's supposed to move through the space and where his crap has to be in order to hang Tom, right? So we it, it seemed pretty clear that we had to do it on the north side of the building so the light didn't change. So it pretty much stayed the same all day. Oh, interesting. Um, and we had a model of the building. And there is a way to, um, they had window washing machine, window washing capsules at the very top of the building that came out and allowed you to kind of move and wash all the windows all the way around, all the way up the building. And it was like you you'd go out, you could go out there with like somebody from Bangladesh and try to communicate with them so that you could find a place where you could see the space outside. And I did it once because I was going to take pictures. And I was so freaked out that I said, I can't do this. And so they hired a local still photographer to go out and photograph the north side of the building in the floors we thought we could use. And then based on that, Greg and I figured out which windows we needed to get rid of in order to put the camera through the windows that we were going to shoot from and then put his rigging through the windows above so we could hang Tom and move him through the space, the outside of the building. So, and it wasn't, it sounds like, it was kind of complicated, but <laughs> we went back and, and did it all. And then um, 
And then, you know, and because we asked, we said, can you get rid of these windows? You know, they're big, you know, they're, they're, you saw them in the movie. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the set that, the that, yeah. that um, the interior of the, of, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the hotel rooms are a complete Jim Bissell cre- creation. They didn't exist. Oh. We were on a concrete floor on an unfinished interior of that space. There might be a little bit of floor, a little bit of wall for reverses. And then there was a smaller set that was built facing the same direction about 400 yards away that was three stories tall, which we shot for close-ups and for other things where we had to do things that we couldn't do on the tall building. Okay. So uh, where we had to see Jeremy Renner, uh, where we had to see the other IMF people in the suite as Tom swings to it and drops off. Yeah. It was an, a really accurate recreation of the outside of the building and um, a, a li- just enough of the inside of the building um, that you'd believe you were in the same room that subsequently we shot on stage in Vancouver. Because okay. all those interiors are on stage. And there's green screen outside in which... Um, you know, the, they were all essentially plates that we shot. I can't remember if we shot plates or if, probably it was I, uh, it was an ILM, but whoever, I can't remember who the visual effects were. It was ILM. It was ILM, yeah. Shot all the plates. And then, uh, uh, you know, the, the guy who kind of got me through all that, of course, was the great, uh, oh, who was the visual effects supervisor? Somebody I've known for 30 years. Anyway, um, it, uh, John Knowles. It's yeah, Knowles. John Knowles, yeah. John Knowles. So, um and you know the the hard part about for me was going into that was matching, to was to get a to make it optically to make it fo- optically real to make it photographically real. On stage, you really want a big space so you can motivate all the lighting that's coming into that set is from the windows. There's no interior practicals on. There's nothing for the most part. There isn't. So everything has to feel like it's ambient daylight, blue skylight coming in those rooms. <coughs> and unfortunately, we're on a sound stage. We're on one of those Vancouver. You know, it used to be somebody's warehouse. You know, the ceilings aren't tall enough and the walls aren't far enough away. And so to create the illusion of ambient daylight was the hardest thing for me because it, it just, that's the thing, that, it's the dead giveaway that you're on a stage and that you're using, because the lighting looks phony. The lighting looks artificial. Yeah. The lighting looks like movie lighting. Right. And to try your best to avoid that was was kind of a struggle because I, I just couldn't get the distance and I was shooting into green screens and anyway, but it, it's okay. But I think John helped me <laughs> fix it later uh, to a great extent. Uh, where was I about? Um, We're talking about going through the ceiling. Oh, going through the ceiling. So that we shot there. Okay. And we shot the struggle outside there. It's like with what's her name when she throws Leah Sadu off the building and all of that. That's yeah. all in Vancouver. And that's all looking back into the set. And we had a two-story. Was it a two-story set? It might have been a three-story set. I can't remember. I think it was a two-story set. Yeah, because we only went on one floor. And and we doubled the floor for the, you know, when they run around and change the numbers. And there's really one floor. And there's a stairway. And we just changed the look of it. And it was, uh, as I remember, it was a real tedious nightmare on the way through. <laughs> well, it ended up yeah. being cinematic It was okay. Magic, it was okay. So, yeah. You know, it worked out okay. It was. So you were uh, never outside. You were never physically me holding the camera. No, well, are there you is kidding? That shot where he jumps over the camera. Yeah, which it's I can a camera. Never... Yeah. No, I mean we had movie bird. <laughs> we had crane. We had three movie bird cranes. And we were had, you operating? Yes. Okay. Well, we had IMAX. Ca- the IMAX cameras are on heads, remote heads, and we're sitting there. You know, um, we, positioning the cranes, picking the right windows, sticking the, being able to put the camera out, and. Um, and shooting all these material, all this different material on film, was um, a you know, kind of a logistical problem that we had to solve by having several. We there were small enough cranes we could get them up in the elevator and we could put the cameras on them. We could shoot out the windows. I'm trying to remember was if we had wind two or an three. Issue up there? No, there's no wind. In fact, that's the issue was there was no wind. And Tom always, you know, he wants he wants to feel there's wind out there. He wanted his hair to be blowing. He wanted his costume moving. He wanted all that. <laughs> so the other part is. The long-suffering special effects unit, on top of you know cables and crap going out there holding him from falling, they had blowers. We had tubes <laughs> hanging down above him, blowing wind out him. So it would feel like you know there was wind. There's no wind at all. It's wow. you know desert. There's nothing. Yeah, I've been to that building. <coughs> I've seen the yeah. little laminated picture. Of yeah, there's nothing going on. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing. Nothing going on at all in terms of wind. And uh, the other part, he had a wonderful, I'm trying to remember his name. He's somebody I worked with years and years ago who was a safety guy uh, that, that Schmier's had 
hanging out the window. He was hanging near Tom so that whenever Tom did something, he could catch him. Oh, God. What's his name? Anyway. And what floor was that on? Oh, I don't remember. (laughs) Zillionth floor. So he's a wonderful, he's a mountain climber. He's a famous mountain climber. And I'd worked with him on a movie years and years ago called The River Wild. And he was one of the people who actually helped us secure cameras to the side of the walls of the different mountains and and, uh, granite structures we were actually shooting on. He's a wonderful guy. And he turned up on this movie. And he was the guy who hung all day outside on a cable... Wow. waiting for Tom to, you know, finish whatever the stunt was, and he'd grab Tom and secure him. You know, there's the thing where he runs around the building, you know, and does that jump and all that stuff. And so I want to say Smitty, oh, God, I'm so bad, uh, <laughs> is waiting there for him to catch him at the end. I'm sorry if you're listening. I apologize deeply if I can't remember you. But anyway, he had had his adrenal, he had a cancer scare, he had his adrenal glands removed. He had no adrenaline. He told me this. And I said, well, what is that? How does that, is that why you're able to, he says, no, I was always able to hang outside and do shit like this. But what this does is, because I have no adrenaline going through me, I can't tell when anything, if anything goes wrong, nothing happens. I just don't feel it. And he said, that's a bigger problem. He goes, if there's a, you know, something, you know, if there's a, like, I just like go, oh yeah, okay. I'm not, I, I, I don't have that surge of like, you know, like that. And so it's good and it's bad. But anyway, that was, he was... Terrific guy. And he's out there the whole time. I mean, he's out there. We would stand there, the crew and I, we're all on harnesses. And we had um, a lanyard, we had ropes that ran to a safety harness, to a safety wire. So if we, if we fell or something happened, which it never did, we, our, our fall would be arrested by these harnesses. So we could move through them. It's like, it like a very elaborate version of um, what you wear in your car, your car seat belt. So if you pull really fast on it, it stops you. Mm-hmm. So we could walk around, but if we like, Move too quickly. <laughs> so, but you, you were so high, you were so high up, but it really was. There were people who absolutely there was like a line that you couldn't cross unless you had a harness on. Okay, but you could, you know, safely you could walk up to the edge and do what Tom does, but nobody could. I mean, there were people who absolutely got on their hands and knees to if they had to work near the window, they would crawl to the window, because you, you know, it's like. Well, I know I've got a harness on, but your mind your mind is just going, You're gonna get this is not this is bad. Yeah. You could you know, if you fell, this would be really horrible. So <laughs> your head is so occasion some of us got a little more used to it, but there was still it was still always a kind of a oh my God, you know, we're this high and how long shall I anyway, that was that was our our week on the uh first Dubai. Dubai. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, that was the other thing was I was saying. They, I asked when I got back there, and they'd removed, we put big pieces of tape on the windows that I wanted to remove and that Greg wanted to have removed and came back. And I went, wow, how'd you do it? Because I imagine there's 12 guys with giant suction cups and they're on scaffolding. Uh, No, we just broke them. (laughs) You know, what? Yeah, we just broke them. We just broke the windows and they fell down. What? They fell down where? Well, down there. And well, how did you, well, we just cleared everybody out. We put these nets down and we just broke all the windows. And they fell? Is there footage of this? <laughs> of course not. You know, I mean, it was like you know, nobody else in the world would let you do that. It was just wow. be like, uh, wow, these guys. That's anyway. amazing. Yeah, I don't know how they. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just broke all the windows. It was fine. That is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, gosh, the, I could talk about Dubai for hours. Yeah. But uh, I, I feel like uh, do you yeah. want to ask about the car park? I mean, yeah. I saw. We've seen pictures of you we wearing were a helmet. <laughs> While you're shooting yeah. the car. Well, yeah. a, a, lot of, a lot of the car mount was a wonderful second, well, we're second unit pieces. I guess I was there for a lot. I don't remember. I, we were doing you something. This is, this is you in a helmet. Oh, is that me in the car park? Yeah. <laughs> Let me I mean, see. There's like multiple pictures of you wearing this helmet in the car helmet? park. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, we were all asked. Well, we had to. I mean, we were all asked to wear helmet. No, oh, you're so, right. This is the both the car park. Okay, so, so were there, were there what it is is, is any, no, no. <laughs> anybody who was working in that space, because it's an industrial space, has to wear a helmet, has to wear a safety helmet. That was just the rule. You know, when you're, because you know, things, you know, it's, uh, well, I can't remember, I have to ask Jim Bissell how many stories it was. It, it was such a big set that it had, the only place in Canada they could build it, in terms of Vancouver, was in this building where they'd actually constructed the Vancouver Ferry. Oh, wow. It's a, I can't remember the name of it, but actually we, we built the same set. We, I mean, we used the same space for, uh, for Skyscraper. 
Oh, really? Because it's the only, yeah, you can build a ten, eight story set or a six story set. I don't remember how big this is. But uh, yeah, everybody wore it. Wow. And we, uh, it was a lot of crane work. Uh, my wonderful key grip, Chris Centrella, the king of the, uh, of the cranes. Uh, works out all the crane work on on both these movies. Were those full okay. size cars though in that moving up and down or? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. Wow. yeah. Then, wow. the, then the helmet makes more sense. Oh no, it, it, <laughs> stuff could fall. I mean, yeah. people could fall. Everybody was wearing. You go up high, you wear harnesses. I mean, it's 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 not a it's not a place. Yeah, it made perfect sense. And of course, Canada's, you know, like we are now. They're very safety. We're very safety conscious. Everybody's very safety. I mean, Paramount. The last thing that we had a safety person with us the whole time. Very, very concerned about, you know, anything. Because this is where people get hurt, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, before we move on to Rogue Nation, we wanted to talk to you because you're the only what? person in the world who shot a 007 movie, a oh. Mission Impossible movie, wow. and, and a, a Born, Born movie. movie. Wow. <laughs> oh, my God. So. I, I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can you talk about the differences between the differences. James Bond and Mission well, Impossible and Jason Bourne? I, yeah. I mean, I I would say I would start. You know, I start with with James Bond. I mean, James Bond was a franchise that had been around for a long time, and it had also gone through this kind of decline um, where prior to Pierce Brosnan, they had Timothy Dalton, and they were made pretty cheaply. I mean, even the original ones were, but they, they because they traveled so much and there was so much wonderful stuff done in them, which nobody had seen quite the same way before, you know, I'm thinking of. And the great Ken Adams, who was the production designer, you know, is the one who figured out that that James Bond, that the villain had to have a lair. Mm-hmm. He had to have this special place that was his lair. And it was always this kind of extraordinary elaborate set in Dr. No, in From Russia, uh, not From Russia with Love, but in, at least in Dr. No and then on to Goldfinger. And then all. So that sort of whole tradition was, was there about the scale of it. And um, a wonderful production. Alan Cameron was the production designer on the one I did, and he was very aware of that. And I, when I went to work with the wonderful Roger Spottiswood, who was the, the director, I was at Eon, which is the name of the company that produces the Bond films, the, the Broccoli's company, Barbara Broccoli and Michael Wilson. Um, I, there's a screening room there, and I was able to screen every day every single Bond movie, which was kind of wonderful. That's wow. so cool. And they have also in the basement a kind of elaborate collection of para- of memorabilia, I guess you could say, like every call sheet from from Russia with Love, things like that. Wow. It was just kind of wonderful. It was like a, a, a trip to movie history, actually, visiting that place. And Alan Cameron had, you know, the the, the evil villain in the in this movie was um, uh, John, Price. John, John Price, who was supposed to be Rupert Murdoch. And I think... Yeah. Um, you know, I think Roger might have preferred somebody else, uh, although I love Roger Price, uh, Jonathan Price. Um, I think he was hoping for, um, oh, fuck, he just passed away. Uh, or recently, not recently, but uh, Long Good Friday, you know. Uh, 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 oh. Oh, fuck me. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> losing actors' names. Is, oh, uh, Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins, of course. And that was, I think that would have been, anyway, but who knows? That isn't what happened. We had the wonderful Jonathan Price. And that uh, all these places were concocted for the scale of the Bond movie. But the difference, of course, is that once, the, that the revival of 007 was really, univer- uh, it was U- whoever it was at UA said, we, or and the Broccoli's, let's, let's, Go with Pierce Brosnan, and let's scale the movie up again. Let's spend the money. Let's make action beats and action sequences. And there was an old-fashioned way of working, in not just in London, but just in the ways those productions were made, where the idea was that you'd go to a foreign country and you'd shoot stunt people, and then you'd end up on a soundstage later, and you'd see a stunt person skiing down the Alps, and then you'd cut to Roger Moore on a soundstage in front of a green screen, kind of pretending to be skiing. And that was that's the old Bond version. And I think Roger was a really good transition into not doing that. And I'm not sure they did that on GoldenEye, but but on, on our film there was pressure not to take Pierce to uh, to Thailand, for instance. So we ended up going to Thailand for all this stuff, and we scouted it. It's like a director scout and a tech scout at the same time, but everybody's familiar. The great uh, Vic Armstrong was the uh, second unit director, stunt coordinator, everything. The amazing Vic Precursor Armstrong. Precursor to Wade, oh, know, in a lot of ways. Just the greatest. Yeah. And um, 
And in my introduction to it, was it all this planning and all these, all these things. Roger was, they were working on the screenplay, and the opening sequence in the movie was shot in the Pyrenees. Um, it's like the French Alps, I guess, right on the border of France and Spain. And, you know, it's, it's a beautiful area, absolutely stunning. And the idea was you're in Afghanistan and there's a kind of a convention of, of evil terrorists getting together and buying weapons and doing all sorts of bad things. And you meet them at the beginning of the movie and then you introduce James. And there's always a great, a lot of thought into how do we, how does he get, how do we meet him? Right. How do we find this guy in this thing? And um, so because Roger was going to stay in England uh, and work on the script, Vic uh, created this miniature like diorama of the location and laid out with Roger everything that was going to happen in the location without Pierce because he was having he was having some problem with his legs and he couldn't run anyway. He had somebody who doubles him anyway and he runs. But he was not feeling, he was, I think he'd hurt his knee and he probably wouldn't have gone anyway. So this was the old version of Bond now we were going to do. So we were going to go to the Pyrenees, and it was Vic, and myself, and like four cameras. And we were going to shoot all this day exterior work of this thing, and Vic had laid it all out. It was really good storyboards for it. And here were the things we were going to shoot in the Pyrenees, and here are the things that we were going to double when we get back to Pinewood. Here are the shots we're going to make that's going to be Pierce Brosnan. And this is how we're going to tie it all together. So that was, you know, that's not that unusual. But that's... Very, that's the old style of that. And that's something and like... That was not the opening of the... That was the opening of that movie. Yeah. Is that, that's how it is now? That's, no, no, yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, absolutely. But, I mean, it had to be. Because actually Pierce wasn't feeling... It, Pierce was right. not in good shape for whatever reason. And it was, a, it was like shot like a month before the movie started. Wow. So we went there because there was still snow. And we did all this stuff. And did all these action beats all the way through. Um, and then everything you see that's Pierce Brosnan, we're actually in the back lot. And wow. fake snow, um, everything else, and and you know it's it's uh, tried and tr- I mean people have been doing that since the movies so, began. But that's very different from Mission Impossible. It is very different because <laughs> because of the nature again because because of Tom, yeah, and because of the whole philosophy of how movies are made, and and you know this was, it was a little old fashioned, but Roger then you know the, the, there was pressure not to take Pierce to Thailand for the same reason, yeah, you know. Why have him, you know, why not, you know, just make wide shots and right. the action beats. And, you know, and Rogers said, come on, you can't, we can't do this anymore. You've got to have, you got to have shots of him. You can't be, you can't do what you've been doing where, you know, you take him to Cuba for a day and walk him across the street. It's, <laughs> it's not. Well, did you have a sort of a more emotional connection to the Bond movies than you had to the Mission Impossible franchise? Yeah, I did oh, actually, okay. because I grew up with them. Yeah. yeah. And they were yeah. like, you know, how do you, there was an actually a really touching I, it was right after Cubby. When I went over there, Cubby Broccoli had just passed away, mm-hmm. and there was a memorial service for him in um, in a theater in London, and uh, it was it was incredibly moving. Uh, he was apparently, you know, he was a an incredible producer. He was not the easiest guy to work with, right. and almost everyone came who had worked on the Bond movies and spoke, uh, and they, they showed clips from all the movies. Wow, um, and it was a, a kind of a, it wasn't it was a very honest portrayal. It seemed to me, not having ever met him, that this was this was Cubby Broccoli warts and all. We're going to talk about, and the one guy who did not show up was Sean Connery, and uh, which I you know I don't you know everybody has their version of that story. I have no idea what really what happened. But I, it was just a little sad, mm-hmm. I think. But at the same time, I got a sense of who these people were, what their company was, what they were all about. And uh, I really, I, I absolutely felt very, very lucky that I was able to go to that thing. But yeah, I had more of a, a little boy thing about, you know, the Bond films and wanted, you know, I wanted Pierce to, you know, when the guy's trying to light a cigarette and Pierce comes up with a beautiful gold Dunhill lighter and lights his cigarette and says, and then says, filthy habit and punches him in the face. That's like my idea of a great opening to yeah. meet James Bond. <laughs> and I have that lighter. Oh, oh cool. that's great. I have it so all. you're going to have a little museum yourself. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I kept the lighter. Well, on that's Born, it. too, at least conceptually, it, it sort of seemed like another ghost protocol in the sense of passing the torch from one actor to another. Yeah, passing the torch. But, you know, the, the, but the amazing thing, I think that the extraordinary thing that many people, but some people forget, is the incredible contribution that 
the reinvention of that kind of a movie by Oliver Wood and um, Doug Liman. The Doug Liman, Oliver Wood, you know, went off to make this small little movie in, with a not a very famous actor in Europe. Didn't cost a whole hell of a lot of money. And they found a visual language that was very, very different. And, it, it, you know, a kind of a, uh, a style of shooting that movie which seemed more energetic and more honest and real and compelling than I think anybody had ever imagined doing before or had done well before. There had been self-conscious versions of it where the camera's panning all over the place and I'm thinking of some television shows from the, from the 90s. But what Oliver Wood and, and, and Doug Lyman did was they found this, this kind of handheld, almost stream-of-consciousness way of, of shooting all this activity which felt somehow more real. I don't know if real is the right way, but you, you always had a sense of geography. You never felt you were being cheated, uh, that they were playing games with the space. Um, you, you watch that movie, the first one, and it's just gripping. And the whole idea that there's a character who doesn't know who he is, and it's trying all throughout the whole movie to discover who he is, and that at the same time, he has all these skills, like how did I learn all this stuff? How can I speak 12 languages and how do I know how to fight? And then refuses every time he gets handed a gun, refuses to use it and throws it away. So I think it's like that, that's certainly the script, that's Tony Gilroy. But the, the way they put it together was extraordinary. There were things wrong with it when it was finally finished, which I think got corrected because they had the, we had the bad luck of having 9-11 happen bad luck. We had a horrible, horrible event take place in this country, which held up the release of that movie. And the things that were wrong with that movie, they decided to address because they had this period of time where they weren't going to release the film. So they went back and shot quite a few days and made all those things I spoke about. Um, a character trying to discover who he was, a character who won't use guns, a character who fights. They, they went back and refined all that and made it more specific and they changed the ending. And they made it into what it is. But it really is, uh, I can't say enough about it, Oliver Wood, Doug Lyman. I mean, they, and what Paul Greengrass did was, you know, his, his style, uh, what, you know, he was famous for taking real events and almost doing the same thing, <laughs> surrounding things with cameras. I think Doug Lyman was a little different. I think that Oliver Wood and, um, not Oliver Wood, but... Um, Gary Aykroyd was... Uh, yeah, 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 Gary they tend to They tend to surround things with cameras, which is a different way of working, a little bit more. I mean, they'll put, you know, three cameras or four cameras in a room and we'll film an event and we'll find... And, and they'll be improvising. And it's a marvelous sort of organic way of discovering what's going on. And then that footage, it's, you know... Um, Gordon Willis had a very derogatory term. He called it dump truck directing, you know. <laughs> That was Gordon Willis being, you know, you know, one camera, you just shoot that shot, and that's your shot. You know? yeah. So, you know, Danny got, but, you know, but this, this way is that you, you are kind of finding the pace and rhythm and performance in the editing room. Uh, and those are different kinds of movies. Mm -hmm. And it works so well for the Bourne movies, and so it works so well for uh, his, uh, you know, flight, whatever that was, uh, for King Chris's, yeah, yeah 93 and all that. So, and that's, that's the marvelous way that Ackroyd did... Um, the one he did with 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 uh, about the guy who's the bomb disposal guy, you know the oh, wow. oh, Hurt Locker, Hurt Locker, yeah, Hurt Locker, right. So those are, in fact, I just had an interesting experience that I I, I was about to do a film that the plug was pulled on, that <laughs> Aaron Sorkin, Aaron, yeah, sure, Aaron Sorkin wrote an extraordinary script about the Chicago Seven, oh, yes. right? It's called the Chicago, it's Trial of Chicago Seven, and. Uh, it's gone through a number of changes over the years. So I think it was originally written for Spielberg. Mm -hmm. And Sorkin told me, I think I can repeat this, it's like not bad or anything. He said that at one point, Paul Greengrass was involved before Sorkin was going to direct. This is, I don't know how long ago. And he'd seen all of Greengrass's movies, and he'd, he's in some conversation with him. Because it's Sorkin, Sorkin's idea is you're not just improvising your coverage. You're not doing what Paul Greengrass does. You're watching the actors talk. And then you, you know, it's a, it's a more it's a more traditional way of <laughs> of uh, directing and shooting. And he said, uh, "Are you going to do that style that you do, where you kind of hose everything down?" Oh, it's a terrible term, but you you know you shoot a lot of stuff. And Greengrass, he said, "Greengrass, turn of course, of course I am." And I, I'm not sure how it all went away, but Sorkin 
uh, when he was talking to me about this, he said, you know, I just don't, I don't think I want to do that. And I went, oh, that's fine with me. I don't right. do that. So that's we'll a, talk about your, you also direct, you also what? photographed a boring movie. So yeah, you oh, I did. Well, I can see, yeah. All I did was, I just thought, I've <laughs> got to imitate Oliver Wood. Oh, did you? Yeah, absolutely. Why okay. not? But I, no, I felt like you brought it a little more. I didn't bring anything. To <laughs> I thought you. Were, I mean, I I love what 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 uh, what Greengrass did with the second and third one. But I th- like the motorcycle chase oh, that, that ends well, Legacy. I think is just unbelievable. Well, it, it is, really and, and we really got to talk about we got to talk about Dan Bradley. Okay, Dan Bradley um, is the guy who, in, who kind of energized all that stuff. Dan Bradley's the, the second unit director. Okay, um, and the stuff in in oh god. I, I hate to repeat stories that I, I didn't see it happen. I wasn't there. So, you know, I just hear these things, and I and everybody has their version, which makes them all sound like a hero. You know? Right. But um, Dan really did an amazing job in, in Moscow with all that stuff, with the, that car chase and the tunnel mm-hmm. and the motorcycle chase and all that. I mean, he, he, he and he did our movie, too. He did uh, the the, uh, the motorcycle chase in um Born Legacy. In Born Legacy. You know, when you shoot bits and pieces, I think we shot a lot of live action pieces on the, there's a thing called the Go Mobile, which I actually used on uh, on uh, the last uh, previous mission, which is, uh, it's kind of like a long tube that goes really fast and that has camera positions and places on it for arms and stuff like that. So you can actually drive in front of somebody or even tow them and shoot lots of unusual shots. In fact, that was the big we did a, a really big improvement on the last uh, on uh, Ghost on Rogue Nation mm-hmm. by um, changing. Uh, Greg really wanted to shoot the motorcycle stuff um, in a in a in a kind of spectacular fashion that hadn't been done before, which meant controlling the motorcycle uh, with hydraulics and having an arm built off the back of this Go Mobile. Think of it as a cam. It's like a narrow camera car that you could move the camera around all the way around the motorcycle from all the way from the front almost to three quarter back with an arm move going 100 miles an hour which meant and and we we did a a series of tests for this uh i can't remember the name of the uh, formula one track in central california but we we went up there uh and shot a bunch of proof of concept things uh to figure out how to do this motorcycle stuff and just did a standard tow before I think they hadn't done the hydraulic work on it, and then based on that and things we'd figured out where to put the camera, we asked that certain things be done to the Go Mobile, that they create an arm, that they you know, and that the mechanics. So there's actually while the car, while the cameras while the car is being driven and towing the motorcycle, the tow bar is pretty long, and it's actually hydraulically controlled. So when you go into turns, there's a guy who tur- who leans the motorcycle huh. to the side. So that the actor sitting on it, you know, going 100 miles an hour. So you can actually get, you know, whatever that percentage or whatever that angle of degree for w- what the Grand Prix riders do, that we could imitate that. Wow. Because Tom Snuck doesn't have a helmet on. And he's, you know, he's got oh, a you wire. you see his knee touching the, the well, ground. Well, no, it is. It absolutely is. I mean, but he's connected to, but still, you know, if a rock came up, if, you know, it's a, he's, yeah, uh, he's like weirdly fearless, you know, all, all the way through. <laughs> You know, he's talking about someone who doesn't have any adrenaline. I think all he has is adrenaline. Right. That's sort of what he is. <laughs> he probably has extra for the rest of us. Wow. So, got a little bombshell there. Yeah. Ethan Hunt would have been the IMF secretary by the end of Ghost Protocol. Yeah. That's crazy. So, he was kind of getting nudged out of the franchise, which, you know, we had, at the time, there was the talk of, of the sort of being teed up for Renner yeah. to take over. Even if you but look at But to hear it full, ugh. I mean, like, there was a version of the movie where, where Ethan Hunt would be the secretary? Yeah, that's crazy. It seems way premature since we've had, you know, two movies since, and there is no, no slowing down Ethan, obviously, yeah. and two yeah. more movies to come. So, yeah, I don't know what that was about. Some very short-sighted executives, I'm sure. Yeah, um, but thankfully we are where we are now. We're where we are now, and we're, <laughs> we're psyched to be there, and uh, we're going to continue this conversation next week. Yes, we will. So, And there are other episodes that people yeah. should tune in for. If you're here just stopping by for Robert Ellswit, you should know that we've done a bunch of episodes about all the Mission Impossible movies. We've interviewed Christopher McCory. We've interviewed editor Eddie Hamilton, the composer Lauren Balf. We've done a lot of a lot of great interviews and other episodes we've done on unmade missions. 
So the David Fincher, you know, and Joe Carnahan and yeah. Oliver Stone was just the making of episodes. There's a lot to lot to check out if you're yes. just passing by. And also be sure to like, subscribe, review, please five stars, get us up there. Um, <laughs> and yeah, email us, contact us on social media at Light the Fuse Pod. Yes. And I guess that's it for this week. And we'll be back next week with Robert Ellswit part two. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. If you'd like to watch the original Mission Impossible television show, all seven seasons are currently available to stream on Amazon Prime. This message will self-destruct in five seconds.